Well, this is a dangerous passage. And it's more dangerous for you than it is for me because I've never been accused of not having enough to say, right? And um, for those of you who, who uh, know me, you know that that's true. And this passage, Acts 17, Paul in Athens, is one of my most favorite bits of Scripture ever. It is a model for what I want my ministry to look like. It's a model of how I want to engage with the world. It's, I love how in this, and, 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 and I shortened the reading, but the whole reading goes on um, to talk about how Paul finds nuggets of truth that God had planted in these people's culture, in, in this Greek, Greek culture, and he's there now to bring it to fulfillment. So it's the reason why I'm pursuing a doctor of, uh, of a ministry, and this scripture is a major reason why I wanted to start this church. I wanted to look like this kind of place. Now, there's lots of fascinating stuff in here, but we don't have all day. I, I do. You don't. So I'm trying to be generous with, with that. Um, but my favorite part of this, as it, though it talks a lot about the why, I mean, about the how that we do ministry in this world. But my favorite part of this, of this passage and the one that we've kept in here is the why. What motivates Paul to do what he does in this passage? Well, first, some context here. Um, if you don't know, if, if you're just joining us or maybe it's been a while, um, we started the book of Acts back in August. What is Acts? Acts is the book of what happened with the church after the church, um, after Jesus died, went to heaven. And as, uh, and as the church went out into the world, and now Paul is in Greece. And he's in the city of Athens by himself. And when he walked in, he saw that the city was, in our translation, has full of idols. Well, I looked at all the English uh, translations. None of them really capture the fullness of, of, what, of what the Greek is trying to uh, say here. It literally means that the city was smothered in them, swamped by them, literally drowning in idols. Moreover, it's in the present perfect tense, um, which means that uh, not only is it this way now, but it's continuing. In, and if you will, more and more idols are coming in. The flood waters are getting deeper. So Paul saw this city drowning, overwhelmed with idols. Well, key to this is understanding what is an idol. Well, an idol is a false god, yes. It's something that takes the place of the, of the true God. But, uh, but uh, you know, of course, one of my favorite uh, 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 pastor theologians is a guy named Tim, Tim Keller. And I think he has the best name for what idols are. They're not just false gods. They're counterfeit gods. It's a great book by that title. Really accessible. I encourage you to uh, read it. But the reason why this is a much more accurate description is because what idols are is they look like the real thing. They look like the real God. They promise the same blessings and benefits. They say, if you worship me, I'll make you happy. I'll keep you safe. I'll give you fulfillment in life. I'll give you rest. And in summary, to sum all those things up, if you worship me, I will give you peace. Peace with me, peace with the world, peace with yourself. You won't hate yourself anymore. That's what they promise. And that's what God promises too. But the problem is, is it's counterfeit. It doesn't work. It's a lie. But it's a really insidious lie because the lie goes even deeper because it's not just a lie, it's slavery. When you begin to worship an idol, not only does it promise you all these things, but once it gets you, it tells you that unless you keep sacrificing everything to me, you're going to lose it all. And in fact, as opposed to giving you peace and fulfillment, it gives you the total opposite. And it's slavery. It's slavery. 
Well, I have a lot of idols, past, present, and I'm sure future. Um, but of course, one that I've talked about often um, was when I was a young man, um, uh, when I was uh, you know, in, in my 20s, um, of course, when I was in college. Uh, I said, you know, what is, what, what's gonna give me fullness in life? What's gonna give me this peace with myself and the world and, and where everything's right and I can finally be happy? What's gonna give me that? What, what temple, what idol should I go worship in? Now, I would say I was, a, I was a Christian at the time, but he was a part of my life, right? If anything, he was there to kind of help me get what I want. And so I decided that because of my family history, that, I, that, that if I was the fourth generation of my family to practice law in South Carolina, then I'd find fulfillment. Then I'd be somebody. It would finally give me peace. So I went to law school. My parents paid for me to go to law school. And as a, as a, as a foot, uh, uh, note, my father, who isn't here, um, he's an excellent lawyer. Um, but he said, you don't need to go to law school. Go do something meaningful with your life. He said, you need to go to seminary. I said, I said that's not for, for me. That's foolishness, right? See where we are now. But, but, I, but I sacrificed all this time. And finally, I took the bar and passed the bar and was, you know, Broad Street lawyer, 25 years old, 150-year-old firm, um, making a decent living, wearing all the right ties, driving all the right cars. And I remember after kind of the sheen wore off about six months in, it was February, and of 2002, and I said, I'm miserable. I've given everything over to this idol which promised me all these things. And instead, I feel hollower than when I began. But, but you see, the insidious thing about this idol of, of being this fourth gener generation warrior is it never said, aha, uh -huh, see, that's right. You're always going to be un unhappy if you worship me. It says, no, Hamilton, it's just, just out of reach. Just work a little bit harder. Just give yourself a little bit more over to it. Work longer hours. You'll make more money. Uh, 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 really put your family in the, in the back seat. Definitely put Jesus over here because he's just going to get in, in the way of this whole thing. Don't volunteer at church. Don't be part, part of any of that stuff. If you're just not worshiping me enough, and if you do, then you'll finally get what you want. Just keep pushing, and you can have it all. And I believe that lie. But the reality is, is it finally actually dug me deeper and deeper and deeper because the harder I pushed, the further it seemed away and the more pain I began to, to experience. And then one day I woke up and felt trapped. Felt trapped. So when Paul goes into Athens... He walks into a city that is full of these counterfeit gods. One, one example is the god Mars, right? You know, the god of war. And let's say you uh, were, you know, probably the opposite of me physically, right? You know, big, strong, aggressive guy. And you wanted to be a great warrior. That's what, that's what your definition of happiness was and glory was. Well, who am I going to go worship that's going to give me what I want? I'm going to go worship the God of war, Mars. Worship me above all, he says. And so when Paul sees this, so that was actually background. Let's get to the heart of my favorite part of this text. When Paul sees this city drowning in idols, the scripture tells us his spirit was provoked within him. His spirit was provoked within him. Now, once, once again, the English translation fails here. It's a much stronger feeling here. It literally means in some places to be so overwhelmed by anger, you have a seizure. It's to be deeply irritated and provoked and literally livid about something. And what's fascinating is that when you read the Greek version, which is the primary version of what people in the New Testament had, the Greek version of the Old Testament, the, the same word is used to describe how God the Father feels when he sees his people worshiping idols. Why? Because he's mad at them? Well, he's 
hurt. But the real anger, the real frustration, the real (laughs) lividness is that he saw all of these people who were beloved to him enslaved by something which was out to kill them. They were chasing after things which they believed would ultimately give them deep peace, but in reality, it was distracting them from the real source of that peace, which was him and his love for them. And instead of being freed by these idols, they lived lives more of fear, unease, dread, anxiety. And he loved them too much to ignore this. And this, and, and this is how it should be. This strong anger is the right reaction when someone who you love is in danger. So he sent Jesus to show them the real face of God. And you see, why that's so powerful to to Paul is because this same Jesus saved Paul from his idols. If we were to rewind the tape all the way back to sort of the late fall, uh, we would remember how uh, Paul was converted. Who was pre-conversion Paul? He was Saul. um, And he was a zealous persecutor of the church. His idol was to look in the mirror and say that he's the smartest, cleverest, most diligent, zealous persecutor of these, of these heretical Christians, he's going to stand up on the true God's side. Was he doing that for God's glory? No, he was doing that for his own internal peace. But what did our God do for him? He showed up right while Paul was at his worst and said, Paul, you will serve me. You will Follow me. And in that, he's conveying his love. He's conveying his forgiveness. He's conveying his welcome. And Paul had no other option at the sight of this great love to fall on his knees to this God who he persecuted, yet who in response rescued him. And so now we come to my favorite part of the reading. You see, Paul walks into Athens and has the same emotional response as God does, because he has the same love of these people he has never met because he knows that they are precious to God. But likewise, I think this is where the power comes in of why Paul's so powerful here. Yes, it's a gift of the Spirit, but how does it manifest itself? You see, what's fascinating about Paul here is there's no arrogance here when he walks in to challenge them on their idol worship. Paul is not some self-righteous, pious person who believes he's smarter than all of them. And he's coming in with this great wisdom to fix everyone in Athens. He's not there to put a notch in his belt. He makes his presentation, it's so powerful and it's so so, uh, beautiful because he, like the Athenians, like all of us, was once enslaved. And Jesus showed up and freed him. And in the inexplicable way that that changes our hearts, he wants these people he's never met to be free too. My uh, dear brother and friend, Robert Hopkins, um, if you don't know Robert, he's somewhat, you know, he's part of a men's Bible study that that we have here. um, And he's been a dear friend for about 12 years now. And Rob, uh, 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 Robert rather, is a, has been a recovering alcoholic for many years. I can share this. He's given me carte blanche to, to uh, share a story, no past story. You don't need to be awkward around him when you see him, you know. Um, but, he is, um, but he is consistently and deeply involved with Alcoholics Anonymous. And one of the fascinating things about him is his desire to help someone who's on the front end of recovering from, from alcoholism is undiminished. He's always offering to help. He sponsors people all the the time. And I asked him, why are you always sponsoring people, Rob? I mean, surely it's got to wear you out. It must make you tired. And his answer is, because, Hamilton, I know the hell that these people are in. And they don't even know that they're in it. I've been there. 
And when you're in it, you don't know how enslaved you are. And it's killing you. And the reason why it's killing you is because the, the addiction, the idol worship, if you will, says that the more that you serve me, you're actually more and more free when in fact the opposite is true. But I can't sit there. My heart breaks for them. I can't sit there and watch them be enslaved. I have to come in and share with them that there is freedom and love that only Jesus Christ can offer. So what does this mean for us? Well, at St. Uh, uh, Thomas's, you'll hear us pray uh, that uh, we are called to be ambassadors of Christ for giving love where we live, work, play, and learn. And there are lots of techniques in that and lots of things we can learn about how to uh, do that well. But at the heart of it, at the heart of it, is we need to do what Paul does here. Paul loves the lost. He's angry, not at them, but over at the powers of sin and evil and Satan, which are oppressing them. The powers of their own heart, which are oppressing them. And so he, so we can go into the world with authenticity of purpose because we're not trying to win. We're not trying to pull a power play on the world. We're not posturing. These, you know, sharing the gospel aren't ego trips for us. We have credibility when we go in the world because we too are idol worshipers. And while we were at our worst, this great God dives into our lives. Gives us forgiveness we never thought we could ever have. Brings us deep into his very belly. And removes every obstacle that we've put up to be in true relationship with him. And so oftentimes I'm asked, well, how do I do this ambassadorship thing? What does it mean? I said, just remember the great salvation that God has for you. Ask him to give you eyes to see that out there in the world. And then just go. But one of the things I love about this uh, church is that there are probably those of us here. Maybe you consider yourself a uh, a a Christian, maybe you're a seeking and, and a searching, whatever it might be. But some of us out here might still be wrestling with idols. And when you hear about God coming to actually give you freedom, you want to be attracted to that. But let's be honest, because we're all there. So it's, it's a little bit scary, right? Because we're afraid that if we actually turn our back on our idols and turn to- solely towards God, it's going to hurt. We might lose In fact, following God might rob us of happiness. But as an idol worshiper, one who's constantly confessing them and putting them on on, in front of God and saying, take them away. As as one who's been cleansed of, of idols for the past 20 plus years. What I can tell you is that your idol is lying to you. Real fulfillment, real joy. Real peace, real peace of forgiveness is found only in Jesus Christ alone. I'm not saying that because it's my job. I'm saying that because it's my life. It's my soul. Jesus loves you. Jesus forgives you. And he has a life for you. And it's life in all of its fullness. And it's a fullness that transcends whatever material fullness that our world says will make you happy. And friends, this is good news for us sinners indeed. Amen.